Chapter 15 of She This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Gisburn She by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 15 Asha Gives Judgment the next thing that I remember was opening my eyes and perceiving the form of Job, who had now practically recovered from his attack of fever. He was standing in the ray of light that pierced into the cave from the outer air, shaking out my clothes as a makeshift for brushing them, which he could not do because there was no brush, and then folding them up neatly and laying them on the foot of the stone couch. This done, he got my travelling dressing case out of the Gladstone bag and opened it ready for my use. First he stood it on the foot of the couch also. Then, being afraid, I suppose, that I should kick it off, he placed it on a leopard skin on the floor, and stood back a step or two to observe the effect. It was not satisfactory, so he shut up the bag, turned it on end, and having rested it against the foot of the couch, placed the dressing case on it. Next he looked at the pots full of water, which constituted our washing apparatus. Ah, I heard him murmur, no hot water in this beastly place. I suppose these poor creatures only use it to boil each other in. And he sighed deeply. What is the matter, Job? I said. Beg pardon, sir, he said, touching his hair. I thought you were asleep, sir, and I am sure you seem as though you want it. One might think from the look of you that you had been having a night of it. I only groaned by way of answer. I had indeed been having a night of it, such as I hope never to have again. How is Mr. Leo, Job? Much the same, sir. If you don't soon mend, he'll end, sir. And that's all about it. Though I must say that that there savage, Ustain, do do her best for him, almost like a baptised Christian. She is always hanging round and looking after him, and if I ventures to interfere, it's awful to see her. Her hair seems to stand on end, and she curses and swears away in her heathen talk. At least I fancy she must be cursing, from the look of her. And what do you do then? I make her a polite bow and I say, young woman, your position is one that I don't quite understand, and can't recognise. Let me tell you that I has a duty to perform to my master, as is incapacitated by illness, and that I am going to perform it until I am incapacitated too. But she don't take no heed, not she, only curses and swears away worse than ever. Last night she put her hand under that sort of nightshirt she wears, and whips out a knife with a kind of curl in the blade, so I whips out my revolver, and we walks round and round each other, till at last she bursts out laughing. It isn't nice treatment for a Christian man to have to put up with from a savage, however handsome she may be, but it is what people must expect as is fools enough. Job laid great emphasis on the fools, to come to such place to look for things no man is meant to find. It's a judgment on us, sir, that's my view, and I for one is of opinion that the judgment isn't half done yet, and when it is done we shall be done too and just stop in these beastly caves with the ghost and the corpses for once and all. And now, sir, I must be seeing about Mr. Leo's broth, if that wild cat will let me. And perhaps you would like to get up, sir, because it's past nine o'clock. Job's remarks were not of an exactly cheering order to a man who had passed such a night as I had, and what is more, they had the weight of truth. Taking one thing with another, it appeared to me to be an utter impossibility that we should escape from the place we were. Supposing that Leo recovered, and supposing that she would let us go, which was exceedingly doubtful, and that she did not blast us in some moment of vexation, and that we were not hot-potted by the Amahaga, it would be quite impossible for us to find our way across the network of marshes which, stretching for scores and scores of miles, formed a stronger and more impassable fortification round the various Amahaga households than any that could be built or designed by man. No, there was but one thing to do. Face it out and speaking for my own part, I was so intensely interested in the whole weird story that, so far as I was concerned, notwithstanding the shattered state of my nerves, I asked nothing better, even if my life paid forfeit to my curiosity. What man for whom physiology has charms could forbear to study such a character as that of this Asher when the opportunity of doing so presented itself? The very terror of the pursuit added to its fascination, and besides, as I was forced to own to myself, even now in the sober light of day, she herself had attractions that I could not forget. 
Not even the dreadful sight which I had witnessed during the night could drive that folly from my mind. And alas, that I should have to admit it, it has not been driven thence to this hour. After I had dressed myself, I passed into the eating, or rather embalming chamber, and had some food, which was, as before, brought to me by the girl mutes. When I had finished, I went and saw poor Leo, who was quite off his head, and did not even know me. I asked Dustain how she thought he was, but she only shook her head, and began to cry a little. Evidently her hopes were small, and I then and there made up my mind that, if it were in any way possible, I would get she to come and see him. Surely she would cure him, if she chose. At any rate she said she could. While I was in the room, Bilali entered, and also shook his head. He will die at night, he said. God forbid, my father, I answered, and turned away with a heavy heart. She who must be obeyed commands thy presence, my baboon, said the old man as soon as we got to the curtain. But, oh, my dear son, be more careful. Yesterday I made sure in my heart that she would blast thee when thou didst not crawl upon thy stomach before her. She is sitting in the great hall even now to do justice upon those who would have smitten thee and the lion. Come on, my son, come swiftly. I turned and followed him down the passage, and when we reached the great central cave saw that many Amahaga, some robed, and some merely clad in the sweet simplicity of a leopard skin, were hurrying along it. We mingled with the throng, and walked up the enormous and indeed almost interminable cave. All the way its walls were elaborately sculptured, and every twenty paces or so passages opened out of it at right angles, leading, Bilali told me, to tombs, hollowed in the rock by the people who were before. Nobody visited those tombs now, he said, and I must say that my heart rejoiced when I thought of the opportunities of antiquarian research which opened out before me. At last we came to the head of the cave, where there was a rock dais almost exactly similar to the one on which we had been so furiously attacked, a fact that proved to me that these dais must have been used as altars, probably for the celebration of religious ceremonies, and more especially of rites connected with the interment of the dead. On either side of this dais were passages leading, Bilal informed me, to other caves full of dead bodies. Indeed, he added, the whole mountain is full of dead, and nearly all of them are perfect. In front of the dais were gathered a great number of people of both sexes, who stood staring about in their peculiar, gloomy fashion, which would have reduced Mark Tapley himself to misery in about five minutes. On the dais was a rude chair of black wood, inlaid with ivory, having a seat made of grass fibre, and a footstool formed of a wooden slab attached to the framework of the chair. Suddenly there was a great cry of, Hiya! Hiya! She! She! and thereupon the entire crowd of spectators instantly precipitated itself upon the ground, and lay still as though it were individually and collectively stricken dead, leaving me standing there like some solitary survivor of a massacre. As it did so, a long string of guards began to defile from a passage to the left, and ranged themselves on either side of the dais. Then followed about a score of male mutes, then as many women mutes bearing lamps, and then a tall white figure, swathed from head to foot, in whom I recognised she herself. She mounted the dais, and sat down upon the chair, and spoke to me in Greek, I suppose because she did not wish those present to understand what she said. Come hither, O Holly, she said, and sit thou at my feet, and see me do justice on those who would have slain thee. Forgive me if my Greek doth halt like a lame man. It is so long since I have heard the sound of it, that my tongue is stiff, and will not bend rightly to the words. I bowed and, mounting the dais, sat down at her feet. "'How hast thou slept, my holly?' she asked. "'I slept not well, O Asher. I answered with perfect truth, and with an inward fear that perhaps she knew how I had passed the heart of the night. "'So,' she said with a little laugh, "'I too have not slept well. Last night I had dreams, and methinks that thou didst call them to me, O holly. "'Of what didst thou dream, Asher?' I asked indifferently. I dreamed, she answered quickly, of one I hate, and one I love. And then, as though to turn the conversation, she addressed the captain of her guard in Arabic. Let the men be brought before me. The captain bowed low, for the guard and her attendants did not prostrate themselves, but had remained standing, and departed with his underlings down a passage to the right. Then came a silence. She leaned her swathed head upon her hand, 
and appeared to be lost in thought, while the multitude before her continued to grovel upon their stomachs, only screwing their heads round a little so as to get a view of us with one eye. It seemed that their queen so rarely appeared in public that they were willing to undergo this inconvenience, and even graver risks, to have the opportunity of looking on her, or rather on her garments, for no living man there, except myself, had ever seen her face. At last we caught sight of the waving of lights, and heard the tramp of men coming along the passage, and in filed the guard, and with them the survivors of our would-be murderers, to the number of twenty or more, on whose countenances a natural expression of sullenness struggled with the terror that evidently filled their savage hearts. They were ranged in front of the dais, and would have cast themselves down on the floor of the cave like the spectators, but she stopped them. Nay, she said in her softest voice, stand, I pray you stand. Perchance the time will soon be when ye shall grow weary of being stretched out, and she laughed melodiously. I saw a cringe of terror run along the rank of the doomed wretches, and, wicked villains as they were, I felt sorry for them. Some minutes, perhaps two or three, passed before anything fresh occurred, during which she appeared from the movement of her head, for of course we could not see her eyes, to be slowly and carefully examining each delinquent. At last she spoke, addressing herself to me in a quiet and deliberate tone. Dost thou, O oh my guest, recognise these men? I, O oh queen, nearly all of them, I said, and I saw them glower at me as I said it. Then tell to me, and this great company, the tale whereof I have heard. Thus adjured, I, in as few words as I could, related the history of the cannibal feast, and of the attempted torture of our poor servant. The narrative was received in perfect silence, both by the accused and by the audience, and also by she herself. When I had done, Asha called upon Bilali by name, and, lifting his head from the ground, but without rising, the old man confirmed my story. No further evidence was taken. "'Ye have heard,' said she at length, in a cold, clear voice, very different from her usual tones. Indeed, it was one of the most remarkable things about this extraordinary creature, that her voice had the power of suiting itself in a wonderful manner to the mood of the moment. "'What have ye to say, ye rebellious children, why vengeance should not be done upon ye? For some time there was no answer, but at last one of the men, a fine, broad-chested fellow, well on in middle life, with deep graven features, and an eye like a hawk's, spoke, and said that the orders that they had received were not to harm the white men. Nothing was said of their black servant, so egged on thereto by a woman who was now dead, they proceeded to try to hot-pot him, after the ancient and honourable custom of their country, with a view of eating him in due course. As for their sudden attack upon ourselves, it was made in an access of sudden fury, and they deeply regretted it. He ended by humbly praying that they might be banished into the swamps, to live and die as it might chance, but I saw it written on his face that he had but little hope of mercy. Then came a pause, and the most intense silence reigned over the whole scene, which, illuminated as it was by the flicker of the lamps striking out broad patterns of light and shadow upon the rocky walls, was as strange as any I ever saw, even in that unholy land. Upon the ground before the dais were stretched scores of the corpse-like forms of the spectators, till at last the long lines of them were lost in the gloomy background. Before this outstretched audience were the knots of evildoers, trying to cover up their natural terrors with a brave appearance of unconcern. On the right and left stood the silent guards, robed in white and armed with great spears and daggers, and men and women mutes watching with hard, curious eyes. Then, seated in her barbaric chair above them all, with myself at her feet, was the veiled white woman, whose loveliness and awesome power seemed to visibly shine about her like a halo, or rather, like the glow from some unseen light. Never have I seen her veiled shape look more terrible than it did in that space, while she gathered herself up for vengeance. At last it came. Dogs and serpents. She began in a low voice that gradually gathered power as she went on, till the place rang with it. Eaters of human flesh, two things have ye done. First ye have attacked these strangers, being white men, and would have slain their servant, and for that alone death is your reward. But that is not all. 
ye have dared to disobey me. Did I not send my word unto you by Bilali, my servant, and the father of your household? Did I not bid you to hospitably entertain these strangers, whom now ye have striven to slay, and whom, had not they been brave and strong beyond the strength of men, ye would cruelly have murdered? Hath it not been taught to you from childhood that the law of she is an ever-fixed law, and that he who breaketh it by so much as one jot or tittle shall perish? And is not my lightest word a law? Have not your fathers taught you this, I say, whilst as yet ye were but children? Do ye not know that as well might ye bid these great caves to fall upon you, or the sun to cease its journeying, as to hope to turn me from my courses, or make my word light, or heavy, according to your minds? Well do ye know it, ye wicked ones. But ye are all evil, evil to the core, the wickedness bubbles up in you like a fountain in the springtime. Were it not for me, generations since had ye ceased to be, for of your own evil way had ye destroyed each other. And now, because ye have done this thing, because ye have striven to put these men, my guests, to death, and yet more because ye have dared to disobey my word, this is the doom that I doom you to, that ye be taken to the cave of torture, and given over to the tormentors, and that on the going down of tomorrow's sun, those of you who yet remain alive be slain, even as ye would have slain the servant of this my guest. She ceased, and a faint murmur of horror ran round the cave. As for the victims, as soon as they realised the full hideousness of their doom, their stoicism forsook them, and they flung themselves down upon the ground, and wept and implored for mercy in a way that was dreadful to behold. I too turned to Asher, and begged her to spare them, or at least to mete out their fate in some less awful way. But she was hard as adamant about it. My holly, she said, again speaking in Greek, which, to tell the truth, although I have always been considered a better scholar of the language than most men, I found it rather difficult to follow, chiefly because of the change in the fall of the accent. Asha, of course, talked with the accent of her contemporaries, whereas we have only tradition and the modern accent to guide us as to the exact pronunciation. My holly, it cannot be. Were I to show mercy to these wolves, your lives would not be safe among these people for a day. Thou knowest them not. They are tigers to lap blood, and even now they hunger for your lives. How thinkest thou that I rule this people? I have but a regiment of guards to do my bidding, therefore it is not by force. It is by terror. My empire is of the imagination. Once in a generation, mayhap, I do as I have done but now and slay a score by torture. Believe not that I would be cruel, or take vengeance on anything so low. What can it profit me to be avenged on such as these? Those who live long, my holly, have no passions, save where they have interests. Though I may seem to slay in wrath, or because my mood is crossed, it is not so. Thou hast seen how in the heavens the little clouds blow this way and that without a cause, yet behind them is the great wind, sweeping on its path whither it listeth. So it is with me, O Holly. My moods and changes are the little clouds, and fitfully these seem to turn, but behind them ever blows the great wind of my purpose. Nay, the men must die, and die as I have said. Then, suddenly turning to the captain of the guard, As my word is, so be it. Footnote The Cave of Torture I afterwards saw this dreadful place, also a legacy from the prehistoric people who lived in Kor. The only objects in the cave itself were slabs of rock arranged in various positions to facilitate the operations of the torturers. Many of these slabs, which were of a porous stone, were stained quite dark with the blood of ancient victims that had soaked into them. Also in the centre of the room was a place for a furnace, with a cavity wherein to heat the historic pot but the most dreadful thing about the cave was that over each slab was a sculptured illustration of the appropriate torture being applied. These sculptures were so awful that I will not harrow the reader by attempting a description of them. L. H. H. End of footnote. End of chapter 15